single for most of my life, so I always had a newer Corvette that I would take on dates and stuff. And then I had a lot of older Corvettes because I love the look of those. And so it's like, yeah, I, I like having an old one and I kind of like having a new one. The thought process came about to maybe combine the two. I knew a lot about both because I'd had both. And I thought, yeah, boy, if we could combine this, it would be a market. My name is Jeff Hayes. My business name is Jeff Hayes Customs. I live in Bloomington, Indiana, and we build Corvette restaurants. Always being a car guy, always wanting to be involved in builds in the process. Really enjoyable to take something that's used up, done, somebody else can't repair it, you can't get it back to numbers matching or whatever. It's like, well, there's another use for this. And you know, anybody that's got original cars, you go out and say a prayer and pump the gas and hope it starts and got the carburetor and you're, you're thinking all along, I hope this works. Then when we get newer cars, it's fuel injected, computerized. You can drive to dinner. You don't smell like gas. Your wife doesn't smell like gas. Your wife's not worried about getting home. And the other thing about a resto mod is somewhat of a blank canvas. You buy an original car and you're going that route you're really following somebody else's guidelines from 50, 60 years ago to put this car back to the way it once was. You know, you buy a Crash 63 Corvette and want to build a resto mod out of it, you know, you can paint it whatever color. You can put, you know, wider quarter panels or wider wheel openings or anything you want to do. It's endless options. My first, I would call it a high-end build, was in 2001. It was a 55 Chevy truck. In 1997, the LS1 had come out. So I looked high and low for an LS motor to put in this truck. I wanted to make it the computerized, fuel-injected truck. Went to the Super Chevy Show, which at the time was held at Raceway Park in Indianapolis. Uh, met a guy named John Spears that owns a company called Speartech. And he had an engine out of a crashed 97 Corvette, had it on a trailer, had it hooked to a fuel can and a battery there, and he could start it up right there on the spot. And I traded information with him, called him in the middle of the week, and uh, drove up to Anderson, bought that drivetrain from him, put it in that 55 truck, uh, won the good guy show with it, won the Super Chevy the next year. You know, really, really, really good success with it. Had a lot of fun, got a lot of offers to buy it. Really didn't build it to, to sell. Uh, but I, you know, when, when you keep getting these offers, you, you think, well, what if? So I put a, put a price on it. First guy I priced it to bought it. And, you know, of course you, you miss the vehicle and you start thinking, yeah, I'll do it again. And that just kind of started the whole process. And I thought, I need to do this to a Corvette. Started building one, got it done, took it to some shows, had a lot of people offer, and I thought, I'm gonna put just a big number on this and put, you know, 100, 150 grand at the time on it. And it took me probably a month, but a guy called up, bought it, you know, and that just, kind of started the process. I did two or three of the C1 body style Corvettes. Then I, uh, I thought, you know, I need to switch over to the C2s as soon as I can. I had a 58 or 9 Corvette in 2008 um, that I had completed and then the economy went, went to heck. And so I, took, I went to Bowling Green to a good guy show. So I'm down at Beach Bend Park with this car. This guy walks up to me and he says, I got a question for you. He says, I see you got your car for sale. He said, you ever take your car to a Barrett Jackson auction? Or you ever been to one? And I said, no. And uh, he said, can I ask why you, you know, wouldn't take one there? And I said, honestly, I'm a, I'm a working class guy. I could never take the risk of that no reserve. And he said, well, I can tell you that with your quality, he said, uh, you would have no problem at all. You, you would do well. And the guy, before I knew it, the guy turned around, walked off, never didn't know who that guy was, anything, but that planted the seed in my head. 
you know, you go home and you start rehearsing it in your head. And so I, I put it in the uh, April of 2009 uh, West Palm Bear Jackson okay. and took it to West Palm. Just kind of hoping to get about 120 grand because the economy was bad. You know, no one had money. No one was really doing a lot. Kind of had to be a deal or nobody was going to buy it type thing. Had hopes of 120 grand. It sold for 135. I thought, wow, this is this is what I'm supposed to be doing. So I, uh, I w had wanted to do a C2. I bought a 66 convertible, uh, built it that summer, got it all done, uh, put it in the January of 2010, Barrett Jackson, Scottsdale. Had it shipped out to Scottsdale, scared to death, economy is bad, no reserve. Wanted 120 for the other, I got 135. I want 150 for this one. Had big high hopes for 150. And uh, sold for 180. And so it, it, it just it basically took off from there. I've always been a, a, a GM guy, always been a Chevy guy. Honestly, I've liked the trucks and the Corvettes about equal, but the, it's hard to argue with the American sports car. The Corvettes just, uh, get attention, you know, good, bad, and indifferent. Um, one of the things when I really got into the resto mod stuff as deep was that I felt like for what I was building, it was a little bit of a two-fold crowd because you got some of the hot rod people that had never seen a Corvette taken to that degree, and then you got the Corvette people as well. So you were sort of pleasing two crowds, and that was that was helpful for sure. The more elements that you can put in those rest of my Corvettes, the the more people will like them. You know, we, you know, you, you take a '67 Corvette with with factory air. It's gonna blow a little bit of cool air, but it's not gonna just chill the whole cab like we're, we're used to with our everyday drivers. These cars, when the resto mods, you don't really have to know how to work on an engine. I mean, these have GM harnesses with a diagnostic port, backup cameras, uh, you know, Bluetooth radios. I mean, with these mid-year Corvettes, uh, they, they have a real unique position of the radio in the uh, center of the dash and there's not really a good way to put a radio in there that looks appealing so then you know there's companies come out that said hey we we offer one that fits in the stock position and it looks just like the original radio but you can bluetooth your phone to it you can play your list all of those things really helped it i think accelerate past the original cars the bodywork is the most brutal part of it. It's dirty, it's nasty, it has to be perfect. Or I always say when you when you spray paint on a car, it's like taking a piece of saran wrap and wrapping it around that car. And if there's any imperfections, you're gonna see them. That's exactly what paint does over the top of bodywork. So the bodywork is enormous in it. Um, one of the things when you do it as long as I have that I have done an okay job at, but try really hard to get loyal people behind you to where you build a network of people that are with you along the way. And that includes things that you can't do in-house, like your upholstery, your paintwork. You know, if you can get a good group to stick with you and they know what you're thinking, you know what they're thinking, and you build a great product, you know, no, nobody can do it all themselves, but if you can get a good group together, a good team, uh, it, they're worth their weight in gold, for sure. A term that I use around here a lot is that when, when you're building a car, build a car like you're shooting a shotgun. You want to hit the biggest demographic that you can hit. You don't want to shoot like a rifle and just hit a very, very small part of the crowd. So pick a vehicle that it, that has appeal to a, to a lot of people and have a plan when you start out put a lot of effort into that plan make sure that it's pleasable to you and and maybe get other people's opinion on it and then stick to that plan and execute it you know quality is the most important thing you know uh, make it make it super nice and and people will appreciate it for sure I still think quality stands out and it's proven through the test of time, that's for sure. I got an original paint 63 split window. Uh, I wanted to build a car like that for numerous years. I looked for a red, black, or silver 
split window with original paint for three years. Was able to get one about a year ago and I put it on the Art Morrison chassis with the new LS3 motor. Put a, a, a manual transmission in it, which I don't do a lot of, but I am keeping this car. So just the fact that it's nice enough looking and different enough looking that it's appealing. It's fun to drive, gets a lot of attention, but it's not so polished and pristine that, that it's uh, worrisome to you every time you get in it. Yeah, I really don't care to do anymore for customers. I have no customer builds uh, at this time. Don't really want to do that. Uh, I'd like to get down to building one or two cars a year, doing them as nice as I can possibly do them. Maybe go a little further into the quality and work on my part to, to make a better car. A uh, huge thing that's important to me along those lines is I, I want to keep on my cars uh, the market up as much as I can. I mean, I, I have quite a few of these out here now and I think it's important to those buyers that if I can keep my value and my brand up, it's, it's better for me, it's better for them and everybody wins.